give a little intro to yourself. Okay, so uh, my name is Dr. Thomas Hitchcock. I am a PhD, uh, so which is, in my opinion, the better type of doctor, but that's debatable. <laughs> um, and uh, so I am a formally trained geneticist, and so I, I did um, uh, a lot of research in um, genetics, tissue engineering, gene therapy, but um, in around the year 2010, I was at Wall Cornell Medical College doing a um, a fellowship in uh, multiple myeloma oncology, and I was in New York City, dirt poor and um, not fulfilled with the research I was doing. So I decided to go into the industry, um, and, and did not choose uh, dermatology on purpose, but serendipitously uh, was recruited by a company, and I uh, came about. Um, in my very first stint there going to a medical conference was very underwhelmed by the offerings of what was being sold in a medical um, conference at, at the booths and such. And so that's really where my research in dermatology sprouted because I decided rather than just kind of complain about it, I'm going to take all the expertise that I had developed over my education and training and try to find a better way to do things. And so that's kind of where we are today. Yeah, I love that. Uh, so BioJuve, I mean, you guys, have, you, you've been working on this for a long time, but it just recently launched. Yes. So I founded the company Zygro Therapeutics in 2013. Um, we sold Zygro to a Crown uh, Laboratories in 2019. And part of the acquisition was that I remain on board and actually see the development of the, um, the technology through to a commercializable brand. Uh, and we launched that January of this year uh, in the United States. And in September, we launched in Australia, New Zealand, France, Germany, UK, Ireland. And um, I believe in January of next year, it's going to go uh, throughout the whole EU and Asia. Amazing, amazing. So awesome. So um, explain a little bit more, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit more in depth about the microbiome of the skin because BioJuve is all about creating that healthy microbiome, but a lot of people have a lot of questions on what is a microbiome and why is it so important, you know? Sure. So, uh, you know, really the, the microbiome kind of in a nutshell is all of the ecosystem of things that live on your body and inside your body that are not you. So um, they call it the microbiome. So biome in a, as a holistic term means the environment in which you live with the like your house would be a biome of sorts um the dog that you have which my little my puppers my beagle over there take asleep and um he would be a constituent of that biome but the microbiome is the uh microbes the things that are too small to see that live in and on your body and um yeah, there's a book that I wrote that we uh, put out this year called uh, with Dr. Doris Day. We, we co-authored this book and it, it's uh, called Rebooting the Biome. And it centers around this premise that um, human history has not been kind to microbes ever since they were discovered. And, and initially they, they were uh, lauded as something to um, harness, then they were lauded as something to destroy. And they actually tried to our scientists debated this for a while, and it's come to where this Western type of mentality is that germs are bad, but what we're finding out now is that germs are actually uh, required for proper health. Um, and what we found out in our research with BioJuve is not only is it good uh, or required for proper health, it's the right strains, the right environment, the right food sources, um, but it's uh, also very much uh, helpful for the beauty of the skin. And we can get into a little more detail in a bit, but um, that's why if you look at the book that Doris and I wrote, the subtitle is that why caring for the skin biome properly is better than any skincare ingredient on the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the thing that I, um, I have been for years, the biggest advocate on gut health and, you know, really balancing out like gut health. Because I think that's amazing for, you know, not only health in general, but for your skin too. And then really, right. you know, digging into the microbiome of your skin, it, it is the same type of thing. If it's not balanced, you're going to have skin conditions and issues and premature right. eating, you know, which 
a lot of people really don't realize. A lot of people use a lot of, you know, inflammatory things on their skin and yes. things that, you know, are actually really damaging all of the 100%. micro- 100%. 100%. I like to, uh, when I lecture, I like to use the analogy of um, food because like what you just said with, with the um, comparison to the gut microbiome, well, when we eat food, that can affect not only um, the types of microbes that grow in the in the in the intestines and the GI tract, but it actually can affect what they produce as well. So, you know, a lot of people think of a imbalance as something that is because you have the wrong microbes. That's not always the case. That the the fact is, microbes uh, tend to populate areas because it's hospitable to them. And then they actually balance each other out. Um, so one of the things that people fail to remember is where did we get antibiotics from? We got them from, mung, from fungus, from microbes. Mm -hmm. And now we have different ways of getting different antibiotics that are artificial, but they were originally discovered through microbes. And the bacteria and the fungus on your skin actually produce their own types of antibiotics. We call them antimicrobial peptides uh, and substances. And... Um, that basically what we did not realize early on is that the microbes on our skin, the ones that are symbiotic to our health, actually keep everything in check and in balance. And it's not as simple as once was thought, which is there are good bacteria and there are bad bacteria. That's not, that's, that's very reductive. Um, the fact is you can have a strain of bacteria be either good or bad depending on the situation. Um, if you give the right environment, it can be something that is critical to your health. If you give it the wrong environment um, or food sources, it can actually cause pathogenesis. And that's one of the things that um, has been something that in science and medicine for dermatology for the last 50 or 60 years, we have really missed the mark on, and we're now finding out how to correct that um, and that's part of the research that we've been doing for the last decade. That's amazing. I love that. I love that. I'm all about like, like the, like, you know, non-inflammatory approach to the skin, the really keeping your skin barrier intact type of you know, way of treating your skin. And there's so many skincare brands out there that want to rip apart your skin and create all this inflammation. And it's just so the wrong way to approach things. Yeah. Yeah, you, you actually just remind me of what I was going to say, and I, I get on rabbit trails and I forget what I'm even going to say. So, uh, but I was going to say that um, I like to, uh, when I equate it to the gut microbiome, when we eat food, um, you know, we have health food and we have junk food. And uh, there's been a lot of studies, not a lot, but there's been a few studies that I'm at least aware of that have shown that there's a, um, a correlation with Western diets and uh, the emergence of neurological diseases like Parkinson's. It's not that the person didn't have the predisposition. It's that when you eat a Western diet that's rich in um, starches and refined sugars and refined starches, that can actually, as a food source, that causes the microbes to produce different substances that they would if, some, if you're eating a very uh, vegetable-rich diet or something like that, which is more of an Eastern, like, pescatarian-type diet. Right. And, and so, um, you know... Uh, we know that in the gut, the the food sources that you have don't affect you just because of the food that you ingest. So like when you drink a glass of, uh, of wine, that wine, the alcohol in there was not created by the grapes. Those were created by microbes that were fermented. And so when you ingest things, the microbes that live in your gut actually digest the food that you are digesting and turn it into other substances. So you literally are absorbing things that you never put in your mouth. And I like to liken that to topicals as well, because um, people don't realize that no matter how much you scrub yourself or how many hydrofacials you give, which I'm not a fan of, but um, you know, no matter how much you, of that you do, uh, you cannot sterilize your skin. And you will always have billions of bacteria and fungus on your skin. And when you put things on your skin, even just plain water, it can affect the microbes in environment, which in turn will affect what they secrete. So each one of those microbes, 24 hours a day is secreting something. But what it secretes is dependent on the way that you treat it. And that's why it becomes so much more important that you don't just willy-nilly choose whatever and stick it on your face, because it's not just important what active ingredients in there. The whole formula becomes 
very important because how does it affect the microbes and the symbiosis of the ecosystem of your skin? And that's something that most companies have not, not even started to understand. And a few have started to understand, like we're trying to, uh, this is a burgeoning thing that we're, we're, just, we're just now understanding. So, uh, you know, Baiju is the first of its kind because it's unprecedented and people normally don't think about all this. But when you do it this way, what we have observed, and we just today, um, I don't know if everybody's seen on social, but we just started this campaign about the perfect pairing with microneedling because we just did a clinical study um, that was going to be published in December. It was accepted in JAAD, the journal uh, JAAD. Um, and we basically showed that when you condition the skin with biojuve, procedure results, you know, are really impressive mm -hmm. because if your skin is healthy to mm -hmm. begin with, mm -hmm. you're just going to react to all procedures in a better way. Uh -huh. um, and yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, we, yeah. One of my um, best friends is a dermatologist as well, and she does laser, you know, laser, you know, procedures and all that. And she says that all the time. She can always tell a difference when someone has a good skin barrier, good mm -hmm. skin health, because their outcome is so much better. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. I mean, it just makes perfect. It just makes sense, like logically. If you're healthier, you're just going to be able to heal better. You're going to be able to do your your skin remodeling better. It, it just makes it makes sense. The real question is, do people understand what it means to have a healthy skin? And I, I think that's that's where we have the deficit because even in medical schools, right now, like I've been uh, asked to lecture on uh, skin anatomy at a certain medical school and. I was fine doing it, but then I said, but I have to be able to do it the way that I want to do it, which is I, I see the skin microbiome as part of the anatomy of skin. And um, because its function is critical to the health of the skin, and we can get into some of the examples of why, um, but they basically say that's too much information. These are medical students. They just need to pass the board. Um, so that's not going to be on the board. And my response is, well, it should be on the board because where else, when else are they going to learn this? Mm -hmm. um, that's when we should be teaching, you know, uh, young clinicians, whether it's an esthetician or a physician or a nurse, we should be teaching them the fundamentals at the very beginning. And so that's where I think there's a, a slight deficit right now that it's, it's starting to catch up. Um, we're starting to see more and more. Um, uh, curriculum, whether it's at conferences or whatnot, surrounding this, and uh, I don't. I think you'd have to have your head in the in the sand to know that it's not something that's going to be very prevalent in the next uh, near sure. future. Sure. I think it's a hundred percent up and coming for sure. So I'm getting a lot of questions. Um, how um, how do you know if you have a healthy skin? Uh, you know, microbiome. Mm -hmm. You know, how how do we? Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, uh, the thing is, you you can tell when somebody has healthy skin. Now, one of the things that I would say before I answer that is that I call myself a holobiontologist, which is a word I made up, um, but holobiont is basically the concept that um, a, a complex organism like a human is actually not in isolation, but actually is part of an ecosystem. And so when you talk about the holobiont, that is I'm the human plus all the microbes that live on me and the environment that I live in. And so it takes into consideration more than just, um, you know, the human genetics and all that stuff. Uh, for me, that's super important because it also considers that I can take care of my skin, but if I don't have a good diet, that's going to still affect my skin. Right. If I don't get enough sleep, that's still going to affect my skin. And so you have to be looking at it from a holistic perspective that if you truly want to have healthy skin, it requires more than just a topical that you put on. It requires a philosophy of what does it mean to actually, you know, be holistically healthy? Yes. Am I getting exercise? Am I eating the right diet? Am I using the right topicals? Am I, are my hygiene habits healthy? Um, things of that nature. But most of the time we are, I think it's easier to say, or easy for most people to say when you don't have a healthy skin biome. And that's manifested by an, typically inflammatory skin issues. Um, you see, we have, as a Western society, we have the highest prevalence uh, of the human population of inflammatory issues like acne, psoriasis, dermatitis, things of those uh, ilks. And it's interesting because uh, in the book that Doris and I wrote, I think it's chapter, um, I cannot remember which chapter it is, 
but it's uh, the chapter we talk about basically the prevalence of things like atopic dermatitis, which is actually found more prevalently in affluent populations, urban affluent populations. And that's because people think that um, the, the more you clean yourself, the more you use soaps and perfumes and de deodorants, is means you're healthy or, or, or just, you know, higher status. But the fact is, um, actually, that is what causes some of these issues by over sanitization. Um, now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't shower. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't use soaps in certain areas. But like, I don't use soaps on my extremities at all, unless I have mud or some, some actual legitimate soil to get off. Um, I do use it in the parts that need it. And we all know what those parts are, <laughs> um, you know, so we don't even get into that. But, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I definitely stay away from washing certain things. And, and, you know, I also don't overwash my face. Uh, for women, it's a little different because if you wear makeup, you have different considerations than if you're a male and you don't really put a lot on your skin to begin with. So for me, for instance, while I do occasionally wash my face in the morning, I, it's very rare because I put on my zygrobes at night and I see no reason to wash them off in the morning. There's, there, I paid good money. Well, I didn't <laughs> because I, but you know, uh, uh, people will pay good money and they don't really want, you know, why would you wash them off? They're doing good things. And right. so I will rinse my face and pat dry and stuff, but um, it's not that you can't because the good news is that the way that we did the system was so that even if you do wash your face in the morning, you're going to still get great benefits and great results because those microbes actually ingress and become part of your microflora and then can do things 24 hours a day. It just, you know, it's just one of those things where it takes uh, a little bit of time for it to actually, for them to actually migrate into the pores because they're not like cars. They're not like, they don't have like an engine. They, they ingress by cell division. So every day when you put them on and you put the activating mist, part of that mist is to cause cell division because we've actually turned that off. We, we actually added a genetic switch to turn off cell division. And for multiple reasons, one is we wanted to concentrate more on making the bioessentials like propionic acid and ROXP P and uh, superoxide dismutase um, and these wonderful molecules that really protect us. Um, and so uh, we turn it off, but then you have to turn it back on every once in a while so that you can actually get ingress into your micro, into your follicles, because that's really what you want to do. Because if you think about the hair follicle, especially in the sebaceous areas of the skin, they go all the way from the surface down all the way into the fat. And so there's actually 10 times more surface area in your follicles than there is on the surface of the skin. Uh, and the majority of microbes that live in the follicle uh, are the majority of microbes, period, on the skin. And um, when, when uh, Dr. Lee at UCLA um, assayed of, uh, dozens of people and looked in their follicles, uh, they found, and this is multiple studies that have found this, that um, about 90% of what lives in the follicle sebaceous areas of the skin is C. acnes. And there are specific strains that are associated with health and certain strains with disease, but it's actually less C. acnes in the follicles of people who have uh, um, diseases like acne and such. And there's actually a deficit of C. acnes in people with eczema or psoriasis. And so interestingly, what we forgot as a scientific community is we were, we were so fixated on what is there uh, when you have things like eczema versus what is absent, mm -hmm. because what we have what we have seen is recently there's a publication that showed that um, Staphylococcus epidermidis, which has been thought to be a skin commensal, um, although it has its own problems that it can cause, uh, it actually produces a enzyme, a protease, that actually digests away the the little linkages that keep the stratum corneum in place until it's ready to slough off. Now, it's necessary for it to produce that because that helps with the desquamation and, and allows us to have turnover of our cells. The problem is when it gets too high, the activity, it actually causes barrier issues. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, well, how do you get that balance? Because the balance comes when you have all the natural flora in, in balance. So the C. acnes actually lowers the pH of the skin. When the skin pH is lower, it actually... Uh, reduces the amount of staphylococcus, but also reduces the activity 
of that protease. And therefore, you start to balance out that turnover. So the c still induces IGF-1, which is something, is the exact same method in which retinols work um, to, to help with some of the benefits. It, that's how it, it also induces collagen induction and such. But it also, at the same time, keeps the oils flowing, <clears throat> keeps the oils flowing, turns those oils into things like propionic acid, which short-chain fatty acids like propionic acid, we, we know those things are very essential to gut health. But guess what? They're also super essential to skin health. Propionic acid keeps melesthesia uh, balanced out, which is melesthesia can lead to all sorts of uh, dermatological issues. Um, and so it's not that we want to kill anything. We want to balance it. That's the key. Right. That's so interesting. I love that. I love it. Um, so a lot of people are, are kind of want to go into the, you know, you're talking about the exchromes and stuff. So mm -hmm. if you could talk about the technology of BioJuve and why, okay. it's, you know, why it's different than other, you know, probiotic brands out there. Okay. So, well, what I would say is that um, I would uh, love to hear if anybody has actually found a legitimate skin probiotic brand, because I believe that um, Zycro, uh, I'm sorry, BioJuve is the first legitimate skin probiotic brand. The reason I say that is uh, you can have, the word probiotic has kind of been bastardized um, over the years because what happened was uh, several years back, somebody had the idea that, um, you know, probiotics are good for the gut, so they're good for the skin, which is probably true, but probiotics by definition uh, has some tenets. And one of the tenets is that the microbe has to be able to survive mm -hmm. in the area you're putting it in order for it to do anything that's beneficial. And if it's not doing something beneficial, it's not a probiotic. And so um, the uh, cosmetic industry tried to put a little coalition together to define probiotic and they defined it as um, a microbe that's either living or dormant which is not true because then flesh eating bacteria would be a probiotic. And so, you know, it's like, there's this kind of reductive behavior with the status quo kind of industry because they, um, first off, they tried to do this before the science was mature enough to actually do it. But now that it is mature enough, they've realized, and this is something that I had to fight through um, and we as Crown had to fight through um, when I sold to Crown, because uh, it's not easy to set up an infrastructure to do what we're doing, because it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. We had to, from the ground up, build a multi-million dollar factory just to make the zygrobes, just to make these little bacteria um, that uh, of XYC and Por2 strain. And um, because when you go everywhere else, the, the topical industry is made to keep bacteria away. So even in our own facility because Crown manufactures most of their own products and um, Crown, uh, you know, the, the people in quality and such were very scared early on because they're like, you're bringing bacteria into a place where we're trying to get them not to be, you know, because we don't want them in our in our creams. <laughs> but then we had, to, we had to teach them that, you know, A, the, the zygrobes themselves can't contaminate things because they have that growth arrest genetic switch. But B, um, you know, it's, it's not like it flies around and it's like an airborne Ebola virus. It's something that, you know, uh, does require you to, to physically put it somewhere. And so once they learned that, that, it went very smoothly and it continued to go pretty smoothly. But again, we're doing something in manufacturing that is typically reserved for things like biotherapeutic products that go through the FDA. And we're able, we're, we're having to do the same type of strict standards to make this cosmetic product that is very powerful, but um, uh, you know it, it was no small feat. And these other companies are going to ingredient manufacturers and saying, oh, that lactobacillus that they use in the dairy industry and they have a surplus of, oh, it's a probiotic? Sure, I'll stick that in there and call it a day. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really where we have had to have a, for lack of a better term, and I hope I don't offend anybody, a come to Jesus moment um, when it comes to what a probiotic topical actually is. And so things like, I'm not saying that lactobacillus ferment, which is not a probiotic, it's a postbiotic. It, it, there is some benefits that have been shown for like UV, um, uh, protecting against UV and stuff because it they do contain some antioxidants. 
But um, the thing is, lactobacillus, there's very little that lives on the skin, if, it, if at all. And actually, lactobacillus is more often found on older populations, which I don't think we would think of as the skin to, to covet, right? It's not the uh, young, healthy skin that we all want. Right. It's, uh, it's skin that actually needs help. And so that's where, um, you know, lactobacillus is great in the gut. You know, it also is in the oral cavity and the vaginal canal and such but it's not really found on the skin. Um, the most prevalent bacteria of the skin across the world for every single person on this earth is C. acnes. And that's the one that we've been trying to kill for 60 years. Right. So interesting, right. So that's what I always say is, is BioJuve has the first, um, you guys use skin native probiotics. It's the first of its kind to actually use, uh, you know, skin native ingredients that your skin recognizes. Yes. And so um, the uh, strain that we uh, have in our product is, uh, we, we designated XYCM42, but it's a subspecies of C. acnes. Uh, it's called C. acnes defendants. So back in 2017, scientists realized that um, in the species of C. acnes, there was such genetic differences between um, the strain that they had grouped them into several subgroups. And so they decided to put them into three different subspecies. So we have C. acnes acnes, C. acnes defendants, and C. acnes elongatum. Uh, C. acnes defendants is the one that has the least association with skin issues, hardly at all. And um, the way that I, I uh, the analogy I use here is, and if you look in the book, is uh, a beagle. So my, I have a beagle. He's my dog. I sleep with him and we cuddle and, you know, he's uh, very loving and affectionate. But he is, his species is Canis lupus, and that is the wolf. Um, so the gray wolf, which is Canis lupus lupus, is the same species as the beagle that I love and cherish, but the wolf would eat my beagle. It's the same species, but the thing is, it doesn't matter. The, the genetic diversity within a species is quite vast. And so anybody that knows microbiology knows that uh, pathogenicity or benefits uh, or protectivity or whatever you want to call it, um, protection, from uh, microbes is strain specific. It is not species specific. Mm -hmm. I love, love that. Do you want to go into depth a little bit on the specific products? And I'm actually sure. those people asking, um, what is this good for everyone? Is it really good for rosacea and acne? You know, because you are helping to build back that you know microbiome of your skin. Yeah, so the, the one thing that is I have a few constraints as an employee of the company that makes it is that I can't promote it for you for um, curing or treating disease states like acne and rosacea. Right. What I can say is that we did we have done clinical studies that have included people with acne and rosacea and you uh, and anybody listening is welcome to contact uh, medical affairs at, uh, at MedInfo all one word, M-E-D-I-N-F-O at crownaesthetics.com. And uh, the, the scientists in that group that I oversee, they can actually send you the publications. Or if you um, Google X-Y-C-M, as in Mary 4-2, uh, that strain is unique. So it'll pop right up the, the first published clinical study. And you can see some of the examples of um, the patients that were treated and their the, the condition of their skin and the improvements that were had. Um, I have to kind of leave it at that because what I can say is it's been shown to be safe for those populations, right. but we can't really say it treats any disease. Right. I gotcha. Gotcha. Um, but I will say personally, I have rosacea prone skin. I have acne prone skin and I have seen, you know, a change in my skin and I keep my skin very healthy, but I've seen a difference since using BioJuve because I just feel like it's it's more balanced, you know, a little bit of redness and things have kind of like dissipated and it just, my skin feels amazing. So, um, as we right. has those, you know, background issues, I love it. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of common sense when you balance out your microbiome, like you're balancing out your gut, those skin mm -hmm. conditions are going to subside. Yeah. Um, I mean, back in, uh, 2016, I took the first cultures home and, without telling any of my scientists I was doing this, I just asked them to make me some cultures of these microbes, and I started putting them on my face, just splashing these, <laughs> these cultures on my face uh, because I wanted to make sure first before anybody else that I knew that, I, that this was going to be safe and that it wasn't going to cause any skin issues. And when 
I noticed my lifelong issue with blackheads when I noticed that I wasn't seeing any blackheads at all. Um, I, I said, there's something here, something is something that we did not get before something is yeah. uh, wrong with the way that we've been doing things, you know, and so um, that's where it kind of got me really excited. But I'll tell you, since then, um, I was always concerned until we started our clinical research. Um, I was always concerned. I knew it would make our skin healthier. I just didn't know aesthetically what that would do. And we all know consumers. Consumers, healthy is great, but they need to be able to see something. Right. <laughs> and, you know, and so, and so we're, I just saw our psychology, right? Yeah. You know, it's one of the reasons why we still have suds in our, in our soaps. Right. The surfactants that cause foaming is so bad for our skin. So bad. Yet, yeah. yet people think if it doesn't foam, it's, it's not, not working. Working, exactly. I know. It's so silly, yep. but it's psychologically drilled into us by marketing. Yep. And um, like, for instance, the Bioju Conditioning Cleanse, I didn't want to call it even a cleanser because I wanted it to be a conditioning cleanse just because the cleansing is actually secondary. It's the conditioning of the skin that is more important. Yeah. And But we, we do have to cleanse because we have makeup and stuff that we need to get off. Um, but uh, you know the 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 thing is we don't have foaming, and I didn't know I don't want to make anything foamy because there's no reason for that other than for experiential, which I get. You know you do want that experience of it smells good, it feels good. We we understand that just like with food, there's health food, there's junk food. The reason why people gravitate towards junk food food is because the experience is good. They right. like the taste. They like the, the, the rush of sugar. Right. The health food is more healthy and it's going to make you feel better overall in the long term. But the problem is a lot of times it's not as fun to eat. Mm -hmm. And so the trick is making health food that's actually also enjoyable. And that's the same as what we've tried to do with BioJune yeah. is we've made a health food that we're trying to make the experience also still good. And while we didn't set out to make it, uh, you know, it be, it's become like this thing about smelling like blueberry muffins. I didn't, I, I didn't, I never thought that until they started saying that. Now I'm like, okay, I can smell yep. it now. Um, but I thought uh, it smelled like um, olives because that's where a lot of the lipids are derived from. But that's probably because in my head, I knew where it came from. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, people have, I had somebody tell me it smelled like Red Bull, which I still don't get. But, um, you know, sure, why not? You know, whatever floats your boat. As long yep. as it smells good enough to put on your right. face, that's all that matters. It definitely smells like blueberry muffins to me. But the thing is, it's not even an added fragrance. Like you, there's no. nothing in there at all that's like an added fragrance, which no. again, I I was adamant that we don't yeah. we don't add fragrances. We do, I wanted the inky list to be as short as possible because you know what one one thing that also is a pet peeve of mine is that you know marketers understand that people um, are swayed by novel ingredients, yep. um, and so what they'll do is they'll take a standard formula off. Uh, you know, and a lot of white labeling happens this way, um, and they'll add a sprinkle of this and that, and just for marketing purposes, and you end up after a while accumulating 50, 60, 70 ingredients. And this is chemistry. Sometimes you can have a wonderful ingredient, but if you add another ingredient, it negates the right. benefits of the ingredient. Yep. And they never test for that. They just say that this has been studied, vitamin C has been studied, so if it has vitamin C, it's great. But the fact is, just like food again, you can have zucchini, which is super delicious if you cook it correctly and, and good for you, but you can put it in zucchini bread and it becomes absolute shit junk mm, food. Right. Um, and, you know, it tastes delicious still, but it's, you know, it's just so bad for you at that point. Right. And that's the same thing with skincare is that people think that, um, that people don't realize that we add way too many things into these topicals. And that's where the great, there are great companies out there that actually know this and they, they invest a lot of research and development into the most concise yet most effective means in which they can drive change. Exactly. And I absolutely love that. That is what I swear by with, with any skincare product that I put on my face. Um, can, I don't know if, if like, if we can kind of talk a little bit about um, you know, there's a lot of brands out there that promote inflammation to the skin, you sure. know, that promote, you know, um, I don't know, just, there's a lot of brands out there that are kind of promoting the opposite, 
you know, of more of this holistic approach, which I am all about, you know, can you mm -hmm. kind of talk about what inflammation does to the microbiome as well? Well, it's, uh, it's kind of a chicken and egg situation because, uh, you know, there's this kind of dysbiosis is the condition in which you have an imbalance and it can, it basically is, uh, the question that was asked before about um, how do you know if you have uh, imbalance or dysbiosis is because you tend to have inflamed skin and the inflamed skin, it's kind of like a feedback loop where if the bacteria senses that it's being attacked by the immune system, the immune system will therefore go on higher alert and the bacteria will protect itself from the immune system by releasing stuff that is irritating. And, you know, it's a cycle of kind of uh, this feedback loop. And so um, it's one of the reasons why, you know, um, you know, for instance, um, uh, when, when I was a teenager, I was super jealous of my older sister because she hit, you know, she was a couple of years older and she was getting all these products to use. Like my stepmother would buy her all these products, you know, shampoos and <laughs> face masks and stuff. And I was like, how come I don't get anything? Like, and so to shut me up, my stepmom bought me a thing of witch hazel. And so I started putting it on and I had flawless skin. And then all of a sudden I started breaking out. Now, yes, I was hitting puberty around this time, but the fact was I had no issues until I started messing with my skin. Mm -hmm. And so then I started thinking, oh shit, now I need to wash it more. So I started overwashing and it got worse. Yep. And so the fact is, it wasn't until I, <laughs> until I was in like grad school that I actually understood <laughs> that the very thing I was trying to do was actually the thing that was harming me. Um, and uh, I was thinking it was better to be more squeaky clean. I don't know if, if people on this are old enough to remember uh, you're not fully clean unless you're yes. just fully clean. And, this, yeah. you know, that whole squeaky right. clean, like, is is good yep. is absolute hogwash that we the were fed toners. and is not true. Right. Exactly. Remember the toners? Oh, uh, yeah. The astringent toners? Oh, my gosh. It oh, like, yeah. And people thought that that meant it was clean. No, actually, it's one of the worst things you right. can do. Right. Yeah. Yep. No, I, I remember all those things. <laughs> but it's yeah. Oh, but no, but, but. Yeah, interestingly about inflammation and such is that um, it's funny because, uh, you know, for so long people have been saying, you know, we got to kill C. actin, C. actin does this, that. Again, they're basing it off research where um, so many labs uh, base their, their conclusions on one strain of a species, and they typically use the, the same strains which were associated with pathogenicity. They didn't realize until about 10 years ago that there were strains that actually have no association with pathogenicity. Um, and it's more complicated than that, but for, for sake of time, um, you know, uh, what they have found is there's a publication in 2018 that uh, showed that when you have strains associated with C. acnes defendants or the healthy uh, um, subtype of C. acnes, uh, they actually interact with the immune system and cause the immune system to have the ability to go and seek out the bad strains and get rid of them. Um, where the bad strains don't do that, they just irritate and cause inflammation um, some, in the right circumstances. But interestingly, what I found even more interesting was that they actually have found evidence that not only can the C. acnes live in symbiosis with the body and the immune system, but they actually at times hitch rides on are inside of macrophages, inside of the immune system. Oh, wow. I mean, and still are living. They're not like they're being digested. They're actually live <laughs> microbes. Right. And I thought that was, I thought that was uh, super fascinating um, because what it shows is that there is such a symbiosis that we're just starting to understand. And um, that's why it requires us to take a step back and say, it's not that we were wrong before. It's that we didn't have all the information and we still don't, but we're every day we're getting more information. And really as clinicians, our duty is to take the information we have and do the best we can with that information. And I think that now what is the best we can is different than what it was 10 years ago. Yeah, for sure, for sure. That's what I love about skincare. It's like ever evolving and we're always constantly learning more, you know, more information. Right. But that's why I, you know, I, I 
it's a little bit of a joke. And even today, um, so we hit a huge milestone with sales of BioJuke today. That's uh, I I don't think I should share the number, but it's um, it shows how people are responding to what they're seeing because yeah. this is this is and um, my. Uh, the the uh, GM Mike McKenna, uh, who's also been, we've been working together for years at this point, and so we're friends as well now. But um, he uh, sent a, a message basically saying something about skincare, and then in quotes he said, "Oh, I mean skin biome care," because I have really drilled into people that BioDube is not skincare; it has skincare elements, but it is skin biome care because it's different in the sense that it doesn't just care for skin; it cares for the entire biome of the skin. By providing the right microbes, the right food source for the microbes, and the right environment so the microbes can do what they need to do and balance the, the uh, skin biota. I love that. Which brings us to a good point where we can, um, I have all the products here in front of me, so we can kind of sure. go through. Um, you're going to have to talk, you're going to have to talk me through what you're holding up I because know, I can't see you. I know. Because a lot of people are, you know, they want to know how to exactly use the products. Do you have to use them? all together sure. to get the best results? Can you put them, you know, can you, you know, add them into your current routine? All those things, you know? Sure. So let's kind of go, we can kind of go through all of those questions, you know, together, but I'm, let's talk about the cleanser first. The what I cleanser? love this cleanser. Oh, the it's cleanser. Amazing. Yeah. It skin feels yeah. so amazing. It is not harsh. I love it. Yeah, so a little background on that is that, you know, when we were developing this, uh, it was this uh, formulation was really championed by a wonderful woman named Sasima, who was the head of uh, product development for Crown. Under She worked under me. Um, she unfortunately passed from cancer uh, a little over a year ago, but um, she was a wonderful woman, uh, and she came from Thailand. And um, she really got the philosophy that I was trying to drive with this, and uh, she... Um, made sure that when she cre when she kind of whipped up the formulations uh, prototypes that uh, it met the requirements that we see today. Originally, they had put lemongrass scent into it. Uh, I didn't want it, um, but they, for marketing purposes, tried it and it just did not, fortunately, nobody, want, nobody liked it. So I got to have my way, which is no fragrances for any reason. Yeah. Um, but originally, uh, we had our uh, a brand manager that was basically hemming and hawing because she's like, um, uh, you know, women wear makeup, and if this doesn't take off, because it wasn't, it's not going to be a makeup remover. It's not, it doesn't, there's not enough surfactant and such. And so she's like, there's no way this will be successful because people won't want to use it because it won't take off their makeup, especially their eye makeup. And uh, my reaction was, well, they can use other things. This is for conditioning more than it is for cleansing. Um, but uh, what we we actually made a little um, micellar water that we were going to sell as well. But then we decided it, we don't need to do that. What we found was that we, we those little makeup erasers, which is the microfiber cloths that you can get, they're pretty cheap and you can reuse them. Basically, if you put those in warm water, you can take most of your, almost all your makeup off almost completely. And then the conditioning cleanse gets the residual off, and it works very well without having to use any stripping components at all. Right. And so. I I always recommend to try at least try the makeup erasers and um, how do you feel about and if waters hmm? how do you feel so about micellar waters what say one more like time the micellar waters how do you feel about oh um they're fine the, the thing is again it depends on the formulation right you you can't give a blank check and say all micellar waters are fine right they're a little messy um you know uh, they can be a little messy. Uh, but, you know, they get the makeup off. That's great. But I'll tell you, in my opinion, why add another set of chemicals to put on your face if you don't have to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your, so your um, cleanser, it, it's good for day and night. And it's great to, like you said, condition your skin and it allows those exprobes to really latch onto your skin, correct? Right. And I, I, I even, like I said, I, I even don't even call it a cleanser. I call it a condition cleanse. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Conditioning cleanse. <laughs> I know it's splitting hairs, but it's like that there's, that's a way for people to understand that there's something that's unique here. Right. And there's a lot of harsh cleansers out there on the market that are stripping the skin of, you know, your skin barrier health, your microbiome health, all of those Absolutely. things. That's Absolutely. Absolutely. Opposite. Yep. So let's talk about, um, let's go right into the nighttime products because these mm -hmm. are the goodies. 
Um, the activating mist and the living biome essential serum. Let's talk about those. Yeah, so the living biome essential serum I call biome in a bottle um, because it has the microbes in it and it, um, they're, they're dormant. So they, we have a proprietary process in which we actually freeze dry them so that they can be shelf stable at room temperature for, uh, we've tested up to 15 months at this point. We have, we're still going beyond um, and uh, you know, they're still clinically viable. Um, and it has the food source that is the favorites of uh, the microbes once they're awake, uh, but they don't, we have no water in that particular product because water would rehydrate the microbes and re reanimate them. So the water in the activating mist is absolutely essential because if you don't wake up the zygrobes, all you're doing is putting lipids on your face and then all the things like malassezia will go to town and cause issues. So it's essential that when you put it into the palm, so the way that initially the directions, and I think they might stay on the box still, um, to apply the, the living biome on the face and then spray the face and mix in. And well, if you mix it thoroughly, that would work. The problem is that most people wouldn't mix it enough that way. So I told them people to start putting a pump of the living biome in the palm of your hand, spraying five or six or whatever, you know, I say go overboard is better than going under because you want to make sure you rehydrate those microbes. And then you mix in the palm of your hand, you can actually feel the microbes dissolving. And then you, and once you see it emulsify, because there's emulsification is important here because water and oil don't mix. So if you don't have an emulsifier in there, the water can't get to the microbes to reanimate them. And so the way that the mist was made was not just a gimmick. It was because otherwise you'd have to refrigerate a live culture. And we knew most people wouldn't want to do that. So we made it in a two-step system so you could reconstitute it immediately before use. But the thing is you have to understand the technology or you're not going to use it properly. And that's another reason why I call it skin biome care, not skin care, because it's something different enough to where you have to edu be educated a little bit to know what is these grains that I'm feeling and how do I make them work for right. me. And you, like you said, you can actually feel that. You can mm -hmm. feel those little, yeah, the zygrobes. Yeah, and it's funny because when, I, when we first came out with this, I was so happy with this formulation and it's still the same formulation, but um, it went to this person in my uh, company that just did not understand what we were trying to do. <laughs> and um, she, uh, basically was like um this is horrible this is people all hate this because it's going to feel all gritty and sandy and i was like you don't get it the thing is they're going to mix it in their hands it the, the the tactile feel is actually a benefit because then you know when you're ready to apply it right um and it even went up to the ceo who basically said thomas we can't have this and i basically said don't worry about it it's it's fine you know and so uh and so and you know, how many months later, it's, it's quite a while later, it's probably a year and a half later since that. And um, as you can see, it's, it's people oh my get God. it. It's so amazing. It's like, honestly, my favorite part at the end of my routine, I apply them and then your skin just has this amazing glow. It feels amazing on your skin. I love it. Like I am obsessed because it does, it gives your skin this like amazing glow to it. And yeah. like blueberry muffins. So you can't, you can't beat that. <laughs> Yeah, and the great thing is that you're you're actually, the, we talked about the feedback loop in the bad way, but there's also a feedback loop in the good way where when you get these microbes happy, they actually cause the skin to secrete more oils, which is gonna give you more radiance. And we, we a lot of times we think of oiliness as bad, but the thing is if you have the right microbes, it's a good thing because the microbes eat the oil, turn it into short chain fatty acids, so you are not oily. Right. So, the more microbes you put on, it's going to make your skin produce more oils, which the microbes will turn into short chain fatty acids, antioxidants, all these. And we can go into specific ones, but that's, that we'd be here all day. Um, and the, the fact is, all this stuff is making your barrier healthier, your skin healthier. Um, and so it's, it's kind of this really great feedback loop of the glowiness actually ends up becoming internal mm -hmm. after a while because you now have this feedback loop happening. Yeah, that's amazing. I, yeah, I love that. Anyone who uses those products at night, I have gotten constant feedback that were, people are, they, they love it. You become like addicted to it. It makes your skin, you wake up with like amazing skin. Um, and it's amazing. But one of the questions I want to ask you that I've gotten asked, you know, from a lot of people, when you're using these living, you know, these living exprobes at night, is there anything that you don't want to mix with them? That's a really, that's a really, um, 
difficult question because um, I would love to say you can use whatever you want. The problem is I can't really be prescriptive here because we, as we talked about before, chemistry dictates everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you can have a vitamin C serum that you can mix and it'd be super successful. And you can have a retinoid that you can mix and be super successful, but you could also have some that are so bad uh, for microbes that it basically negates any benefit that you're going to see. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I mean, I could, you know, talk, I mean, that's where clinicians are going to have to come to find what works right for, well for them. Um, because the reason why we created a, a standalone regimen is because we knew this was going to be a, the case where people were going to ask this question and we wouldn't know what to pair with the living. Like if you stick to only the, um, the living biome at night, you're gonna have great results regardless, but then you put makeup on during the day. So we wanted to give a holistic approach so that you, people could basically have skin biome care 24 hours a day. Um, we study, in our clinical studies, we only use our regimen because that's really the only way we can um, keep yeah. variables right. down. But it does not mean that you can't use other things and have even more success. The thing is we just can't test the tens of thousands of products that right. are out there Right. It, we we would we'd be out of business, you know, very early on if right. we did that, you right. know. And so that's where it's hard to answer that question because I know people want to attempt to use other things, and they can, and they're going to be successful. And I bet you anything. Kind of my vision years ago, I I told a, a PR agent this. Uh, she asked me what was my goal, and my I told her my goal is to change the way that we do dermatology, and she said. Well, well, that's a little too grandiose. Think of another one. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, and so I'm like, still, that's my goal is that I want to wear L'Oreal and Johnson and Johnson and Skin Better Sciences and all these companies actually say they found something and we're going to start making products that are compatible because that's the way that is going to be better for people's health. And that's where the market's going to go. And interestingly, each of those companies I just named tried to get a piece of Zygrobe uh -huh. before we sold the crown, but for whatever reasons, it didn't happen, so. Yeah, is there certain ingredients? Like I know a lot of people are saying like benzoyl peroxide, you don't want to use, obviously probably with this technology. Are there other uh, well, they wait well I would say it depends, like I wouldn't use it at the same yeah. time, no. But um, it doesn't mean that if somebody has acne and they still want to kind of, because one of the things about benzoyl peroxide is, it, as we all know, it's it's pretty harsh. Um, it's the reason we use it because we want to get rid of um, you know the the overabundance of uh, some of the the pathogens and such. But the thing is, you again have to think of it long game. Like you can't just think, okay, I get rid of it and then I'm going to solve everything. No, the thing is, it's it's going to bounce back. And plus, now you've stripped your skin a little bit. It's a little irritated, and so. It makes sense that you would, if you use something like a benzoyl peroxide, and we at Crown sell a great um, product for that called Pinoxyl, um, but if you use that, it makes sense that you're going to want to make sure you restore that barrier as soon as possible. Right. And so it becomes an opportunity for you to say, let me take care of both things. And eventually, hopefully, the goal is you wean yourself off of Pinoxyl or, or, or any other BPO because you... You don't want, we don't want people to have acne for the rest of their lives. Right. We want them to get rid of the acne. It's the whole reason we make these products. Right. And so the idea is that if you get it under, you can get it under control with strong medications like a, a tretinoin or something, but eventually, you know, you have to think about the holistic approach to skin and whether or not that's good long-term or whether you should try to then switch to something like a skin biome care regimen to kind of keep the balance happening. Right, right. Interesting. Okay, I love that. Um, so moving on to like the daytime products, because I am, again, I have been using both of these in my regimen myself, um, every morning and I love them. So the serum, the biome support complex, this serum, I, it, it feels, it makes your skin so soft. It's so light and it just is amazing, but I kind of want to dive into like why this is so important and what this is doing for your, you know, what this is doing for your skin during the day. Yeah, so um, what's the key ingredient in um, that serum is the ferment product that is made by the zygrobes. And so you were calling the X-grobe, it's actually zygrobes. <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> um, it, you, you, no, no way of you to know that. Um, I, you know, I made it up, that's why I know it. 
But, um, uh, you know, it's so uh, the zygrobes, basically, when we grow them in this large fermentation tank, the soup, basically, that it grows in, um, we take that and we put that into this product. And I've had people say, and it's, it's understandable because I've heard people use the analogy to say, well, it's the poo of the bacteria. And I say, no, that's not what it is. Because when we think of poo, we think of like useless waste where you have to remember these microbes, they, this is not just a byproduct of their ingesting something and spitting something out. This is actually filled. There are some things like that in there. Like for instance, they take short chain fatty acids and part of what they spit out is, I'm sorry, they take uh, fatty acids and part of what they eat with this, when, this, when they eat the sebum is they spit out short chain fatty acids, which are very beneficial. But there are things that they strategically make. And so people don't realize that bacteria is, are not what we call planktonic, meaning they don't, they're not just these free floating things that just kind of move around. They actually um, colonize areas of the body. They actually go into each follicle and they build homes there. They literally build homes. We call them biofilms. And in the medical community, it, those are thought of as a swear word. But the fact is biofilms are how the microbes in our gut protect us. They actually form a, a barrier so that the bad ones can't get through. And when they form these biofilms, they actually, um, I call it decoration, they actually decorate their homes with things like antimicrobial peptides that keep the ones that they don't want in their territory away. They kind of draw a line in the sand. And they, they put things like antioxidants in there. So C. acnes is a, what we call an anaerobic microbe. It doesn't like oxygen. Um, so unfortunately, it loves living in the hair follicle. Well, that's not unfortunate, but it loves living in the hair follicle. But unfortunately, we our bodies push things out, and so um, the sebaceous glands secrete oils, and it pushes some of those C. acnes out. And when they hit the surface, they're like, "Oh no, I don't like this oxygen environment." So it'll start producing a bunch of antioxidants, like uh, Rox P, which is unique to C. acnes, or superoxide dismutase, which is super great for getting rid of uh, free radicals. Um, and interestingly, it's protecting itself, but in turn, protecting us. And I'll tell you a little secret is that we just put the same ferment in this product into a SPF formula um, and found that it raised the SPF just by adding that. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. Wow. Oh, the second part that's really good about it. Um, so, uh, you know, it's great because basically... For those who do wash their face in the morning, you're washing off a lot of the great stuff that you just spent eight hours making. Some of that is fine because you know, you're getting the benefit for eight hours, but part of the reason for this is that you're putting back on that same environment that you just washed off only in a clean <laughs> way, I guess. <laughs> um, and then also there's a, a film former that's typically used uh, in dispersing zinc oxide and sunscreens that we added to this, even though there's no zinc oxide. Um, because what it does is it makes a breathable barrier that keeps things with, like preservative systems from your makeup from leaching down and, and causing more dysbiosis. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Oh, wow. And that's also in the barrier creams, that same film. Oh, form. is it? That's what I was going to mm -hmm. go on to, dehydrating barrier cream. I love this. Yeah. So the barrier creams are for people that just need more moisture. Um, you know, because yeah. a lot of people, especially as we age, we, we get a little drier. Um, I particularly have always been not a dry skin person. Yeah. Um, and so I don't use it myself because I don't need it. But for those who do need it, that's what that's for. It's to um, uh, add a little bit more uh, moisture to people that really need it. Yeah. And I actually, I have more oily skin too. So I actually don't need like a moisturizer all the time either. But yeah. the I love that you have a normal to oily and then a normal to dry because the normal to oily right. for me is perfect. It's just as like, you know, hydrating enough. And I love the ingredients in it because I'm all about creating that healthy skin barrier. And you mm -hmm. have, you know, the, the science behind the product that it's not just a moisturizer sitting on the surface of your skin. Like it's actually creating that change and, you know, really helping to keep that barrier healthy, which right. I'm all about. Right. Yeah. It all works together because remember it's biome care so we want the microbes the environment everything so it's all formulated strategically yeah yeah no i absolutely love it um i'm not sure if you have anything else you kind of want to talk about or add or take any questions or um i'm happy to take questions uh let sure. me see if you guys have any questions that you want to ask let me see what we have what we got here 
I don't know if I'll be able to see that. Yeah. Oh. oh, maybe I can. So someone wants to know, um, will the products help with like rosacea mites? What is your, what is your take on that? <laughs> um i don't know we we haven't looked um what i would say is the same thing as i said earlier on is that we can't claim that it's going to treat or cure rosacea but what we can tell you is that the rosacea patients that were in the uh, original and the subsequent clinical studies we've done uh three four at this point um we we've been able to see marked reduction in the signs and uh, of, of like redness and such so uh, we can't say it's treating a disease state. We don't know what it's doing with these mites. I think it's also controversial whether the mites actually are causing the rosacea or if they're there because of the rosacea, which is the, the debate of causation versus correlation. Right. Um, it's the same exact reason why we villainized C. acnes for 60 years, because James Layden, who's like one of the grandfathers of dermatology, of modern dermatology, he was on our podcast a while back and he said that he his group was the first that, that um uh proved that c acnes was found in the the follicles of acne lesions of, of pimples and in his paper he said it's not necessarily because they cause acne but because the follicle is the home of this microbe and therefore that's why we're finding them yet people disregarded that explanation and started saying C. acnes causes acne. And so the causation versus correlation is very important to note that some of the things that we thought we knew aren't exactly correct. And we're just starting to find that out. Yeah, for sure. Um, people are definitely asking what your thoughts are of the hydrofacial since you mentioned you're not a fan. <laughs> oh boy, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Um, so let me say uh, my, my uh, colleague and friend, Angela McDonald, who may or may not be watching, um, she actually is uh, a good counterpart to me because I'm um, a pretty uh, pure scientist in the, in the way that I think and a lot of times the way that I lecture and sometimes it gets me into hot water. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but the fact is she says, because uh, I, I used to just say, I would never do hydrofacial, you should not do them. And she said, Thomas, um, you know, let's not think of it that way. Let's think of it as an opportunity. So, cause I don't like hydrofacials because you're sucking out things that you need. Like the filaments of your, of your pores is not trash. It's not gunk. Those are things that are essential, not only for making your pores look smaller because the, the, the sebum, when it's not oxidized, actually acts like wax in the sense that it diffuses light and makes it to where you can't see your pores as readily. Um, but also it's a food source for the C. acnes that lives in those follicles and it's going to be so healthy for your skin. So, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why I don't like, you should not be sucking the stuff that's good out of your skin. Right. Um, and so, but then we're like, the opportunity is, well, why don't we look at it this way? Some people have things in their skin they probably should suck out. And this is an opportunity to put biojuice on the skin after you've had a fibrofacial and reboot the biome that way. Right. And I was like, that's a great way to look at right. it. Right. That's <laughs> so. very true. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's very true. Um, yeah. Let me see if I have any other questions here from everyone. Let me scroll through here. I mean, I think that we kind of hit all the topics that I wanted to talk about. Yeah, well, you know, if I'm going to be completely honest, I often cannot remember what I've said from one lecture to another. <laughs> so sometimes I think I've covered something and I haven't. And uh, sometimes I've said things three times in the same lecture. So <laughs> I know you a lot of speaking these days, I feel like. Yeah, and I love it. This is one of my passions, one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I hate it when I, I what I want is to make sure that everybody can understand the things that I'm saying. Um, and that's why we wrote that book because originally when I started drafting the chapters of the book, um, they were very textbook-like, um, which would have been fine if you're a PhD student, but we wanted to write it, um, Doris was really the one that championed it to be written this way, wanted to write it in a way that anybody could pick it up and get it. And um, that's what I've been striving to do the last few years is try to give these talks in a manner in which the audience that's listening whatever um, level of education they are can understand it and really um, you know get the, the the light bulb to go off of oh so 
maybe I've been doing some of this wrong and it's time to kind of move on to other type of tactics. And there's a quote um, from Maya Angelou that Doris, actually Doris Day, um, she, she used to say this to me or paraphrase this to me and I always thought it was her that came up with this, but it was actually Maya Angelou that came up with this quote, which is along the lines of, um, it's when you know better that you can then yeah. do better. And um, that's rings so true to me that I tell everybody that do not get mad at me because I'm telling you that there's possibly a better way to do things. You know, there's nothing that I'm saying that is personal attack on you or any company. It's that I am looking at it from what is dermatological science and medicine telling us today that we didn't know yesterday. Right. And how does that, how is it best for us to maneuver um, to move it forward? And while there are a lot of wonderful companies out there, we have to remember that companies exist to make money. And um, sometimes there's very there's great companies that will take a bit of a dip in their revenues in order to do the right thing and to go the right direction. And there's others that as long as there's people who will buy it, they will sell it. Mm -hmm. And that is the problem because when that's the, that's the way things work, it's hard for companies to compete when they're investing millions of dollars into R&D when other groups are just getting something off of right. the shelf and calling it a day. So that's what you're up against when you're innovating is that you have to be able to not just bring, there's, there's a grave, when I was raising money for Zygrove and such, there was people that were investors uh, that were meeting with me and, they, they, and I've heard this adage multiple times that there are graveyards full of wonderful ideas and innovations that never see the light of day because people just don't have the vision to look past the status quo. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame, but it's reality. And that's why I am so humbled, but very proud at the same time that we were able to get where we are with this technology because I feel it, the potential is just, we just hit the tip of the iceberg. For sure. I, uh, yeah, for sure. And I'll do, let's do, there's a couple questions coming in that people are asking you know, we talked a little bit about like acne and rosacea and how building back that microbiome really helps with skin conditions. But, you know, what about, you know, anti-aging? Because we all want sure. the anti-aging effects and the fine lines and wrinkles and, you know, right. someone asked pores, you know, how, how can it help with pores, mm -hmm. all of that. So I don't, if, if you can right. talk about sure. that. Sure. So um, again, I would recommend everybody go to uh, the, the literature and read that article um, that has uh, pictures of people that were in the study as well as the, the gradings and stuff. But um, one of the things that is, uh, makes me chuckle even to this day is um, my, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the physician, her name is Dr. Mona Alcom, and she, um, is, she works under me as the VP of Clinical Medical Affairs at Crown. And she, she showed me, she's the one that conducted these studies, and she showed me um, the images of the uh, an, an initial images of the first study and the very first picture she showed me, because I come from an industry where people use um, lights and shadows and stuff to kind of fudge things. Mm -hmm. And um, I am very sensitive to that. I don't want to be looked at as a company like that. I want to make sure that when we have our before and afters, we've done everything we can to make sure that people see that as that's a legitimate before and after. Um, and um, I looked at this image and I had always, I, I had, I think I mentioned, I had been a little bit nervous about, I knew it would make us healthier. I just didn't know what it would do aesthetically. And when she showed me the first image and I saw there uh, above the lip of this lady, she had very visible texture and pores. Um, she also had some wrinkling in the jowl area and it looked like somebody had gone through and Photoshopped that stuff oh, wow. out. Wow. And I I, and I had not seen, I've never, I've seen wrinkles that look better, um, but I've never seen wrinkles completely disappear with a topical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I felt bad to ask her, but I had to ask her, did you touch these up? <laughs> and she got so offended. I don't know if I'm out of the doghouse even to this day, but um, you know, she's wonderful and she, she's one of my favorite people at the company, but um, she, uh, uh, so, so the thing is, then the question was because uh, Angela Wilson, um, who uh, McDonald, who uh, actually is the one I talked about earlier, she um, is the head of education for Crown, and she said, "Guys, there's so much that this is doing aesthetically. I don't know how we're going to explain this to people and then believe us because we were actually 
is seeing so many signs of uh, anti-aging, if you will, that we were we were like, how do we explain this to people? Because we were still trying to understand what was happening, what were these microbes doing, and we since have had a long, we've had years since then to actually do basic research, which is part of the publication. Um, I wanted to make sure the publication had both the science and the, the lab work, as well as the clinical in it, so that people could see that they reflect each other and it's not just like some smoke and mirrors thing. And um, so we started to ask why, because we saw even one person that it looked like the laxity had improved and we're like, that's not, that can't be real. Like you don't see laxity improvement with topicals like that, unless it's a gimmick, like it's a, a thing that shrinks and then when you wash it off, it goes away. Hey. And and so, but we saw, not only did we see um, in the after, like the, the six months uh, after or whatever, we saw every time we took a time point, we took four different time points, it progressively got better and better and better for everything we were looking at. And so we were, so we were like, we have to be able, so we had, uh, we have Dr. Moon Suri, who's been with me since almost day one with this research. Um, he works in our biomedicals and uh, bi uh, biosciences division. And um, he uh, is the kind of guy that spearheads the growing of the microbes, the development of the microbes and such. And so he went to work and started to prove some of the things that we, we, we need to know. So like what antioxidants are we seeing? And so what we found is that um, the, the reason why we see a lot of texture is because we're chronically inflamed. Mm -hmm. And if we're chronically inflamed, then we have edema in our skin which is a collection of water, which causes puffiness of the skin. And the follicles are like tethers, like on a, uh, a bench or where you put a button in there and you see a dimpling because the, the, the cushion material will push the other parts up, but where it's tacked down, you see a dimple. It's the same with the follicles that they're tethered down, and, but the skin around them can be puffy when you have edema. Yeah. And, um, and so when you get rid of that inflammation, you do two things. You rid yourself of excess water of edema, which is heavy and will weigh skin down. And you also reduce the appearance of texture because now the skin will sit flat against the pores. And so that's why we think we're seeing, and additionally, we, we showed that the zygrobes, um, we compared them to retinoic acid and, and, and ascorbic acid in our testing and found that in our testing, we saw that um, while ascorbic acid and retinoic acid do things like upregulate collagen and IGF-1 and such, Zycrobe does the exact same thing, but the difference is that those things after, at six hours, they look great, but at 24 hours, there's absolutely no benefit, where with Zycrobes, it was a, a level that is steady even at 24 hours. And so that's where the real key is, is that there's, we're not saying that there's not great molecules. We're saying that how many times a day do you have to, to put this on? And additionally, how do you get it into the skin without ruining the barrier? Mm -hmm. But the thing, but you have microbes that you can put on your skin that will do the exact same things. They will live inside the skin and do it holistically 24 hours a day. We think that's the better way to do it. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, the technology, the science is, is so cool. It's so fascinating. And I feel like like it is, it's like ahead of its time. There's nobody doing, you know, what you're doing and BioJube has, you know, you created with this, with this brand. I just think it's so cool. Mm. Well, I can't disagree. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, your skin looks amazing too. So. Well, thank you. <laughs> and people use, I mean, I don't know how old you think I am, but most people think I'm uh, younger than I am because, uh, you know, and I can't say that none of it's genetics. I'm sure some of it is, but, um, you know, I, I, my philosophy for the last 10 years has been, I don't use anything but yeah. zygrobes. Right. I, I mean, it's so, so fascinating and so interesting. And I- No I, Botox, nothing. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, do you have anything else you kind of want to add about? Did we miss anything? Did we, uh, is I, there anything? I think I saw somebody ask about the book. The book is called Rebooting yep. the Biome. You can just Google that on Amazon. Uh, you'll see it. It's, you know, uh, we We've been getting quite a few people reading, which is great uh, recently. So we're now um, number one in dermatology on Amazon, which is super awesome. Amazing, yeah. um, and, and, you know, I, I, it thrills me not because, um, you know, of the status, but because I want people to, to read this information. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's for me. Doris and I knew we, wouldn't, we weren't going to make a lot of money on this book because of way, it costs a lot of money to make a book. Um, but uh, we, we, we just wanted to be the ones that actually 
we're the truth tellers yeah. and, and get this out to the people. So um, as many people as that can read it, if you have to lend it to a friend or something, please yeah. do. Um, no. The other thing that I- I just oh, love it myself. So I'm, I'm reading this at night every night. <laughs> good. Yep. Well, when you're done, tell me what your favorite chapter I is. I will. I will. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but I think we've uh, covered everything that I kind of yeah. to cover with you and, you know, the questions that I was getting asked from a lot of people. So I think we kind of covered everything. I think everyone really enjoyed this and, you know, a little bit more info on, to, you know, into the BioGube products. I think everyone really benefited from learning a little bit more. So thank you so much for joining us and uh, you know, giving us the more inside scoop here. My pleasure. And, uh, you know, you guys can always uh, contact me. I can't get to everybody's um, questions and stuff as much as I'd love to. I do have a, a full-time job, so I can't stay on social media all the time. But, um, you know, we have a whole team of scientists. So, again, if you go to medinfo at or email medinfo at, uh, med, uh, at crownaesthetics.com, uh, they will get back to you. Now, if you are not a provider... Um, I would just go to your provider to ask questions um, because, uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot more of you than there are of us. <laughs> so we have to be careful not to over. I don't want my people to quit on me. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that's true. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hitchcock. I appreciate you, you know, coming on and sharing all of this with us. I really do. Thank you so much for your time. My, my pleasure. Anytime. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. You too. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye.